Welcome back to the one the one climate.net channel broadcasting live from the Copenhagen Climate Conference. Uh, uh, you can put your questions and comments to our next guest at oneclimate.net or use the Twitter hashtag oneclimate. Uh, last week, the small island states uh, pushed their agenda here at the conference, and uh, now the question is, will the major emitting countries agree? We've got President Mohammed Nasheed of the Maldives here uh, to discuss exactly that. Uh, there's little question that the Maldives' uh, su survival is completely at risk uh, due to climate change. Um, but let me ask you, first of all, uh, Mr. President, thank you for being with us today. Other than making emotive appeals, uh, which you've done uh, about the survival of your country, what is it that you and your allies can do here in Copenhagen to force uh, the major emitting countries to comply? Well, you know, um, uh, countries have put their offers on the table. Uh, when you add up all the offers, um, uh, what you get is, of course, um, much uh, lower than what we expect, which is 1.5 degrees um, of temperature rise and 350 parts per million uh, of carbon in the atmosphere. Now, uh, we're not getting that. Um, when we do the sums, the gap is fairly wide. Uh, now, the question is, uh, how do we um, um, reduce the gap? Um, one very interesting um, thing that is happening here is a number of um, subgroups, sub-states or, uh, or provinces. Let's say Quebec, um, um, California, Wisconsin, um, Catalonia, Bavaria. A uh, um, number, number of state governments are offering, what they are offering is much, much more handsome and better than what the center is offering. Now, we all understand that energy is not a central government issue, actually. Um, it's not like foreign affairs, it's not like defense. So in a sense, what um, uh, central leaders um, are talking about and unable to lead might be very, very irrelevant um, if we can have these um, governors and first ministers, um, um, uh, what they are offering might be more hands handsome. So we need to do the maths again and see where the gap is. But ultimately, it's the central governments that need to sign a treaty here, and it's the central governments that pass the legislation, like in the United States, that will make the, the ultimate difference. Are you feel like you're making any progress with them? Um, um, no, but I, I understand uh, we're not making any progress with central governments yet. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to point out to central governments are that uh, when you have your local governments uh, giving more ambitious um, um, targets, and they are the people who are in touch with the people. Um, and, and if the people are ready to sign this deal, there'll be very little reason why um, central governments or heads of states should obstruct that. Um, yes, I understand that you know, um, legislation uh, is required uh, by uh, the central government, and treaties and conventions would be bound by central governments, very true. Um, but if we go into a monitoring situation where we can monitor state governments, so I, you know what we're asking for is the powerhouses, the gensets, to give up their emissions, not Whitehall and Washington and and Delhi and China, you know, and Peking, not not necessarily them, but exactly what would. Um, individual powerhouses do? Uh, are they willing to offer anything better? So what we are seeing here is um, states, provinces, um, they are offering better than their central government. You mentioned uh, Delhi uh, and Beijing, you mentioned 1.5 degrees. Your proposal on the table aims to reduce global temperatures by, so that they don't rise any more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is actually, this proposal has been uh, rebuffed by China and India. Uh, and scientists at the same time are saying it may already be impossible to keep global temperatures down to 1.5 degrees Celsius because of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. So considering the political uh, ramifications of this as well, is, could it be counterproductive, this proposal on the table? Uh, well, you know, it's politics and we, are, we, be, oh, we all of us have to be ready to negotiate. But we have to understand there is a, a process called carbon sequestration. You can remove carbon from the atmosphere and you can still come back to 350. So for us, 350 is very sacred. Uh, we want to remain there, but we also do understand that we need an arrangement. We need an understanding. We don't want to go home from Copenhagen without an understanding. 
Um, and again, um, I would like to point out, um, no, I don't think the Indian government is uh, going to rebuff or is going to turn around, turn away from us. I, I really do not believe that. Um, um, I have a lot of confidence in Indian leadership. Um, I'm very confident that what they come out would be well within our own targets. Uh, uh, the question of the Chinese government and the American government, um, it remains to be seen with what they are willing to come out with. Are you going to be speaking with President Obama when he comes here later this week? And if so, what are you going to say? Well, you know, um, or President Obama or any leader, what they should now understand is this is the time to lead. This is not the time to follow the pack. Um, leaders should be going out to the country and convincing their countrymen that here is a serious issue, here is a serious situation. Um, so you cannot palm on your uh, difficulty to the parliament and saying that it's the parliament or it's the Congress. No, uh, this is not on. You just have to go out and you have to lead. I'll remind everybody that you're watching OneClimate.net and you can put your questions or comments in uh, for President Nasheed at OneClimate.net. I'm with my colleague, Adam Groves, who's been moderating the discussion. Uh, Adam, what are, uh, what are people saying right now? Do they have questions for the President? Yeah, President Nasheed, thank you for joining us. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk about uh, the Maldives' decision to go carbon neutral um, and uh, quite a lot of discussion about how this is to be achieved, especially when the economy is so reliant on air travel. Um, how, how are these kind of competing uh, dynamics reconciled? Uh, we seriously understand the issue of air travel and the amount of carbon that um, um, aeroplanes are emitting. Until we find a better fuel um, for airplanes, one of the main things for adaptation is to have a vibrant economy and to survive and to develop. Uh, we cannot forego tourism revenue. Um, so, uh, in a sense, when we become carbon neutral, what we are suggesting is that if you stay in the Maldives for two weeks, instead of staying in Germany, China or the United States, uh, it is far better uh, even if you travel. Uh, but then uh, the kind of um, um, uh, carbon footprint uh, of uh, 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 um, air travel of about 5,000 kilometers is quite, quite substantial. We totally understand that. But until you f we find uh, uh, an alternative uh, aviation fuel, uh, we'll have to offset that with other activities. Many of the small island states have said that they won't sign what they call a suicide pact. They won't sign any deal at the end of this conference that doesn't reduce uh, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius or less. But what will you do on Friday if the deal on the table does not meet, those, meet your requirements? Well, let's see what is on the table on Friday. Um, we are still on Tuesday. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and I, I want to ask a, uh, a question about um, going carbon neutral. What is it exactly that your country uh, is planning to do? How are you going to manage to go carbon neutral? Because it's quite a, quite a strong statement you've made. Well, uh, we've already um, um, started work. We've signed contracts with um, Suzlon, um, who's building a wind farm in the south. Uh, General Electrics um, is building, and, and Falcon and Energy and General Electrics, they're building another very big wind farm. Uh, we are also harnessing um, um, water streams, um, uh, ocean currents. Uh, we want to harness solar. Um, I think this is quite achievable. Uh, why we are doing it is two reasons. One, it is cheaper and more economical. Um, um, I, I strongly believe the leaders of the 21st century would be those who are bold enough to understand the future of green technology. Here is a new, um, the world is going to have a technology revolution. And if you're not part of that, you certainly cannot be a, a leader in the 21st century. Uh, so those who want to be left behind can be left behind. You know, uh, if, you, if you consider, for instance, for the United States, it's difficult for you to get mobile access in the United States than it is in India. It's because the um, United States had, back in the 1920s, um, done all the landlines. They've connected everyone through landlines. So when the new technology came, for them to switch to new technology was far more expensive. So it took them a few more years um, than those who are laying technology afresh. Um, so you know, what we're saying is um, uh, recurrent expenditure is cheaper. Um, oh yes, capital expenditure is high, but uh, we don't have to import oil. We have our natural resources. We just have to harness that. And more importantly, if this is economically feasible for the Maldives, 
and it can be done in the Maldives, why on earth can it not be done everywhere else? Um, um, we just want to do the right thing. Um, we feel that this is the way to go forward and, and we hope that we can lead by example.